Okay, there, thank you. I couldn't unmute. <clears throat> Can you hear me okay? Sound is good, all right. Because if, if, if it's too soft, uh, let me know because I can put my ear pods on. Just put in the chat if it's too soft. Thanks, Jim. So good morning, everybody. Uh, it's all, it's 11 here on the um, Pacific Coast, but for all of us in the United States, at least, it's an hour earlier. Uh, I almost forgot, but luckily now the phone remembers. So here we are together. Uh, my name is Trudy. This is our Sunday morning sitting group at Insight LA, and we're going to wait just a few minutes for people to arrive. <clears throat> Excuse me, since everybody's still pouring in, and I'm going to get actually some more water. I'll be right back. In the meantime, as we're welcoming people and they're arriving, you can look and see who's here in your gallery view. Happy to see many of your faces. I'm happy to see all the names and the one who's, ones whose um, cameras are on. And, and it's fine to leave your camera off. I love, of course, to see your face, but it's also completely okay. This is your sitting group and your time. So feel free to be as you are most comfortable. I have to do one more thing. The heat is on, it's too warm in here. And yes, I am sitting on an exercise ball. If you wonder why my chair is able to go like this, um, that's why. Oh good, I can see you all better now. <clears throat> okay, so once again, um, welcome to our Sunday morning sitting group. My name is Trudy and I'm the founder at Inside LA. Very happy that we're here together today, especially, um, especially during this time. It just feels like more important than ever to gather and remind ourselves of 
the goodness and love that is possible in the human heart at a time when we're surrounded by so much news of brutality and uh, hate. So we're here to strengthen the goodness and celebrate the goodness in our hearts. So for those of you who are new to our sitting group today, we, it's, we divide the time in roughly into thirds where we do a meditation, which we're about to do now shortly, and then have some teachings and then some conversation and a chance to have some dialogue with each other. So during the meditation, I will offer some guidance, some prompts, and also please feel free to do whatever practice it is that you like to do, that you have been doing, that you want to do at this time, um, and find the posture or frame for your body that works for you. For some people, it's sitting up straight on a cushion on the floor or on a mat. For other people, it's being comfy on a couch. Um, if you can keep your back straight when you're in a sitting position as much as possible, that's good. If you need support and offer that to yourself, that is also good. If you're lying down, I just offer one, um, one tip for practicing lying down, which is to put your elbow pretend I'm on the floor, I'm lying on the floor. So my elbow is resting. This is the floor. My elbow is resting on the floor, but my arm is up like that. And the reason for that is that if I start to fall asleep, my arm will go like, and then I'll be aware of it because it's when you lie down to meditate, which I've had to do at different points in my life, um, especially after I broke my back for a long time, it's more challenging to stay awake because we're conditioned when we're lying down to just relax and go to sleep. And this practice is about going awake. So finding your comfortable posture. So we begin by taking a deep breath in, a conscious, intentional, deep breath in. And releasing through the mouth, breathing in through the nose. And out through the mouth. Breathing in this energizing, enlivening breath. And breathing out, releasing tension, relaxing as much as possible. And tuning into the body, whatever shape it's in, and letting the attention drop from the head where it's usually hanging out, letting the attention drop gently down like a falling blossom. through the neck and shoulders, arms, hands. Down the front of the body and the back. To the seat and the legs and the feet.
Just sensing and feeling the body from within the experience of being this body. Tuning in to the dance of sensation. The body as a field of sensation. And sensing and feeling the sensations of the breath in the body. And just taking a moment to appreciate this body, which is the fruit of many lives. And noticing how the body responds to this attention, this awareness, this mindfulness that's being offered. You may feel a subtle shift, a sense of more aliveness. Again, just appreciating the aliveness of this body.
And if you feel drawn to offering some loving kindness phrases, the practice of loving kindness, of metta, or friendliness toward experience, is an antidote to worry and fear and anxiety. May I be free from suffering, safe and protected. May all beings be free from suffering and be safe and protected. May I be able to see, to recognize seeds of joy in myself, even in the midst of suffering. May all beings have moments of joy, even in the midst of suffering. May I trust that the goodness of my heart's intentions matter. And may all beings trust that the goodness of their hearts truly matters in this world.
May my heart be steady through the ups and downs. of this life. May I keep my head cool and my heart warm. May we and all beings keep cool heads and warm hearts. May my heart stay open to this painful world. May I have the strength to keep my heart open in this painful time.
May all beings find the strength to steady and balance their hearts at this time. May I allow joy and sorrow to peacefully coexist in the same heart right now. May the hearts of all beings embrace the joys and sorrows of this time.
So once again, welcome to our Sunday morning sitting group. My name is Trudy. I'm the founder of Insight LA, speaking to you from San Rafael, uh, California, the unceded lands, from the unceded lands of the Coast Miwok tribes, 12 of the tribes of indigenous people who lived here before for many, many generations, probably thousands of years before, before we got here. And today I want to just offer some words and teachings on how to keep our hearts open during a painful time. And it certainly is a painful time as if it wasn't before. It was already painful enough with the pandemic you know, and, and we're hearing that it's over and everything's reopening, but it's not yet over. People are still getting sick and dying and healthcare workers are still overwhelmed. And it's, you know, um, place everywhere is short staffed because of people being out sick and so forth. It's, it's still a hard time. And, and yeah, things were already difficult enough um, before. And, and the geopolitical situation was already in stable unstable enough with wars in Ethiopia and Darfur and elsewhere. Um, but now we have uh, the war in Ukraine. And so the question is now with things even more frightening, how do we respond? And what does our practice, what does the Dharma have to offer us during this time? So that's what I want to talk to you about. Uh, this morning. And I also just want to say that for me personally, being here with all of you is so heartening, just by virtue of your being here, of our being here together. You know, this is really uh, a tribute to the goodness in our hearts, and to our longing to align ourselves with the goodness in our hearts, even when um, it might seem like what's the point people are being bombed while we sit here together and what can this help well we do need to we can trust i trust that somehow this does help because we are all connected in ways that are so much more mysterious than we know and you've all had experiences of this i'm sure you know a, a premonition of something that then happened or having you know thinking of somebody and then getting a call from them or um at times somebody passing away and you're having a sense of it i mean there are so many ways that we are interconnected that we don't see that aren't you know physically evident to us and so we when we do this together i feel like we can transform at least um at least in our hearts, this suffering world into a sacred world of appreciation and goodness and joy with the generosity of equanimity, um, all of these things, and that that and that that matters and that it will make a difference. It's like the teaching, that famous teaching of Thich Nhat Hanh that he gave um, at the time of the war in Vietnam, after the war, when boats of refugees were escaping the fall of Saigon and so forth, he said, if, you know, if one person in a boat remains solid and calm, that is when he says solid, grounded and calm, that boat is more likely to stay afloat. Just one person. And that one person is modeling and embodying a way for everyone to survive. And I really see our coming together to do this practice as an expression of that wish that each one of us has, that we could be that one person, at least for ourselves. And, or at least, you know, the many parts of ourselves that are freaking out, we can be focused on that part of ourselves that can stay solid and calm, grounded in the present moment. and and also for our loved ones, and also for our communities. So the Dharma offers us the chance to be that person whose energy is benevolent and helpful, 
and so needed for ourselves and for everyone around us, for our communities at this time. And it doesn't mean that we're just going to sit and meditate and be quiet and, and not respond um, to what's happening in the world. It means that we're going to respond from a place of steadiness, that we're going to respond from a place of more care, more balanced care, I would say, because we all care all the time, uh, a more balanced care and that we can respond with more clarity and compassion and perhaps more willingness to look and understand uh, both sides of a conflict, whether it's an interpersonal um, conflict or a global conflict. And it doesn't mean um, excusing or anything like that, but just the wish to understand, to look deeply into our fear, to look deeply into our aversion and um, to learn from it to learn as much as we can. This is possible for us. Um, and then we can make a difference too. If you are feeling discouraged, I do want to recommend to you, and I think Ava is going to put it in the chat. Um, maybe it's already there. Let me look. Oh no, that was from Jim. Oh, Jim, nice to see and hear you again. Um, Ava can put in the chat there's a link from an article that I read in the Washington Post about an art teacher who started this fantastic project with uh, the kids in her class where they decided they were inspired by TikTok um, and they, were de they decided to create a hotline for people, this is little kids doing this, for people who are upset. And I called the hotline uh, and I listened to every one of the options. If you're frustrated, if you're anxious, um, if you just want to hear kids laughing and be cheered up, um, what to do when you're upset. There's a whole menu of options and the kids uh, give you their advice on what to do and how to cheer yourself up and how to get through a tough time, um, how to deal with your anger and it's, it's of course charming because it's kid dharma, but it's also, I, I felt uplifted. So I want you to uh, look at that link in the chat. And as soon as you feel the news is just like scrunching your heart into misery, call the hotline. <clears throat> now we being grown ups, um, we also have the tools of the Eightfold Path to help us become that person, that one person in the boat. And we've been looking at the Eightfold Path, and I know Jocelyn talked about uh, wise effort and wise view last week. First of all, we can see, I mean, none of us has to be, um, you know, super informed or even perceptive to see that, that the causes of suffering, to, to see that how much suffering is caused by hatred and greed and ignorance and possessiveness and grasping. Um, I watched uh, a documentary about Ukraine called Ukraine, well actually watched two, one was called Ukraine Revealed, one was called Ukraine on Fire, and they were not particularly bloody or gory. They were really mostly talking heads of state politicians and they were made, um, one I think was made in 2014, one was made in 2016. But it helped me understand some of the history of this country. And, and also um, during one of the dialogues, I, I meant to get the name, of, but it, you probably wouldn't know that person, I didn't either. One of the politicians says, whenever we're talking about politics, we come back to money. And that's what brings us right back to greed and grasping. And we can see the suffering that's caused by all of this. And, and we can also see with wise intention, with wise thinking, that it doesn't help to pile on about it. It doesn't help to amplify um, the, the reactions that we have to this. It doesn't make things go better. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't. Um, even though there might be that emotional 
uh, attraction to doing that, just to try and release some feelings. It, it doesn't help. Hatred never ceased by hatred. It's not patriotic to hate and call people evil, no matter what evil things they are doing. Hatred never ceased by hatred. Hatred ceases by love alone. This is the eternal law. Everyone loses in a war. The Buddha understood this. Uh, he spent time talking to kings and trying to avert war and promote peace where he could. Um, and he was very clear that in terms of um, livelihood, which is one of the, you know, the part of the Eightfold Path are the, is the practical part, the relational part, our wise behavior, our wise speech, our wise livelihood. The Buddha made it very clear that selling arms all over the world is not a wise livelihood. Selling arms to your neighbor is not a wise livelihood. Um, you know, that was a very, very clear teaching. And we can draw on the steps of the Eightfold Path. We can draw on all these things that we've been listening to and studying about over the past weeks, you know, we can draw on them to, to help us. I know that I need to because otherwise I get very frightened by the situation in the world. It's scary. Um, and we can draw on them not just for the conflict in Ukraine, but as I mentioned, the conflicts all over the world. There are conflicts that get less attention, but they are also happening and they deserve our compassion and caring. Um, and we can see, we can see in our own hearts, we can see in our own society, how our thoughts and words and actions and that they add, they either add to our sense of uh, confusion, they either add to our fear, um, they can add to our self-righteousness, our self-righteous indignation, right, that feeling, and they can amp it up, or we can see how our practice can lead us. I love that phrase the Buddha used, onward leading. And what he meant by onward leading was that which leads toward peace and happiness. It's very simple. Not so simple to do, but simple. Um, and I noticed that somebody was asking for the reference of the documentaries. Um, they were just called Ukraine on Fire and Ukraine Revealed. And I liked these because they provided a different perspective on um, the narratives coming out of Moscow or Washington or, and, and whether you are moved to subscribe to those perspectives. I'm not asking anyone to believe anything, but for me, it, and I'm just sharing what works for me, for me, it's helpful to learn different perspectives and learn some history. Um, I would was a psychotherapist for many years and I know that our personal histories, what we lived through, the conditioning that we received when we were small and growing up, um, it really affects who we are, how we perceive the world, the kind of attention that we offer to the world and to ourselves profoundly. And so learning a little more about history also affects the kind of, um, it helps me have some more equanimity and I mentioned earlier the generosity of equanimity. And it is a kind of generosity to step back and just let things, see things, how they are, how they are from this angle, how they are from that angle. Um, and I haven't seen Winter of Fire, but I know Netflix is promoting it. I will say about the two movies that I mentioned that they were um, produced by a member of our community, Oliver Stone, and that they have been taken down from YouTube, but they can be seen on um, Rumble. Um, and if you look, there are places where they can be seen. Um, so with wise attention, we can speak with a little more compassion a little more steadiness of heart. We can act and, and use words that foster well-being in our hearts. Um, I don't know if any of you are aware of the work of um, a neuroscientist uh, named 
Dr. Ian McGilchrist, who writes about the different hemispheres of the brain and how they work together. Uh, that much of what we've heard about the left brain and the right brain, it's very kind of fixated and not true to the way the brain works, which is really together, both sides working together. But I was fascinated to read that it's actually our right brains um, that are the ones that are more involved in empathy, in, in the qualities that we cultivate in Dharma practice, uh, in relational intelligence, uh, emotional intelligence, um, that is involved in the kind of consciousness that uh, humanity needs and that we want to become, we want our individual consciousnesses, I want my consciousness and I trust you want yours or you wouldn't be here, to be more of an instrument of peace, to be able to hold and express and manifest more of the kind of consciousness that humanity needs, which is the kind of consciousness that can um, see both sides of a conflict, that can stop the war in our own hearts and the wars and feuds we may have in our families or communities, that can let go, that can forgive. I mean, these are all beautiful things to say, but it really does work with microcosm and macrocosm, the microcosm being us, each individual one of us, and the macrocosm being the whole, the whole context, the whole vast interconnected context in which we live. Um, and I want to read you um, a teaching that I actually shared last weekend at the retreat with Anam Tupton and Norman Fisher. Um, and this was a teaching that I received in 2005 at a um, conference with the Dalai Lama and neuroscientists in Washington, D.C. And uh, it was coming out of the research of a German neuroscientist, Wolf Singer. And he did a kind of thought experiment that goes this way. He said, if one asks a neuron in the brain, what are you doing? The neuron will say, I'm sitting here quite comfortably with other neurons around me. I'm getting signals from 10,000 others at this moment. And then I just do some simple internal calculations. And then I send out signals to 10,000 others. And, um, and that's probably what a neuron would say if a neuron could talk, right? And then uh, Dr. Singer went on to say that you would get a similar, similarly restrained answer from a human being in our society if you ask the same question, like, what are you doing? And, you know, what are you? and that human being will tell you, um, I live alone, or I live in a family, I have children, or I don't. If I do, I educate them. Um, I work to support myself. Um, I help out in various ways. But this response is not really seeing how we belong to the life of the whole planet all the time. It's not really recognizing that what we do as we work, raise our families, um, take care of business, that there's an embeddedness that we have, that we are in this whole network of life, this whole network of life on the planet, this whole planet. And then he goes on to say, it's not really recognizing that what we're doing as we work, raise our families, do whatever we do, that whatever we're doing as we write our dissertation, whatever projects we're engaged in, that as we do these things, we are creating all of human culture. That each one of us is not, I'm just adding this, that each one of us is not just a passive recipient of the culture in which we live and learned about in school from certain angles that were taught to us, but that each one of us, as we move through life and do what we do, are creating, sustaining and creating human culture. And to me, that's empowering, that I'm actually part of creating the human culture that I live in. Um, he says, we're creating this society. We're moving it forwards or backwards by what we choose to focus on and do in our lives. 
And just as that neuron isn't going to say, oh, I'm part of this magical, miraculous, amazing brain. Um, of course, I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little. And then just realize what it is to be a brain and a consciousness and a brain and a consciousness that can love and grow and change um, and learn and know things. Uh, so each neuron is just for, you know, getting my signals and doing some calculations and sending out uh, my signals. This is a teaching, it's a thought experiment that Wolf Singer gave all of us to do. And I think it can be a bridge from what we're doing here, breath by breath, moment by moment, sitting with our aching knees or hips or back in my case, or you know, whatever's going on in our lives, our fears and worries and horror, um, or the anticipation of what good things may happen later today or this evening in your life, whatever it is that we're sitting with as we sit here with ourselves. This is a bridge between understanding the way that we sit with ourselves and the way that we approach experience with our attention and the way that our attention and approach forms experience, forms the culture and context that we live in. And it has everything to do with the love that we experience in our lives. It has everything to do with our society and with the very life of this planet. It's like um, big love, maha love. <laughs> maha means great in Sanskrit. Um, so this morning, you know, we can, um, we acknowledge that we can experience all kinds of tough and construct contracted um, states of our minds and hearts right now and really any time and but we have a choice in how we respond to that and we have a choice on what we kind of stay with and linger with and and sometimes it doesn't feel like a choice right there are things that just appear in our consciousness and grab us and seem to continue and just have a, a kind of magnetic force, you know, the attention keeps getting drawn back to them over and over again. Um, but we know that that will change, that we're not always going to be like this or that, whatever the this or that is, um, and that we can remember, even when we're suffering, the freshness and magic of possibilities that are here for us all the time. And we can reflect on the places where we may find ourselves unsteady and how we can sit and quiet our minds and hearts and maybe approach things differently with the wise effort that Jocelyn talked about last week. And then when we send our money for support, whatever we do, our actions are coming from a deeper understanding and a more universal sense of our place. Um, in the family of things. Uh, and this is hard to do in a time of war, but it's even more important right now. Because after all, somebody has to remind us, the teachings remind us of who we actually are, of who we can be, and the beautiful thing is we have these practices of love, of compassion, of appreciative joy, of equanimity, spaciousness of the heart, generosity of the heart and mind to be willing to see different perspectives and sides of a situation. And it's really only when our own hearts are peaceful that we can um, that that peace will come through the actions that we take. And this is our inner nobility, and it's the no nobility of the Dharma. The Dharma that is beautiful in the beginning, beautiful in the middle, and beautiful in the end. Because we all know where this is headed. In the specific, particular sense, we don't know. But ultimately, we do all know where this life is headed. 
and that's why we come here to express our goodness and the beauty of our heart's intention together. So thank you for your listening, everybody. This is uh, some of what I want to share with you this morning. It's a fraught time, and, and, and it's so interesting because when I was preparing um, so my talks, some for last weekend, I was going back over some Dharma talks I had given many years ago. And it was so interesting to see that a talk say, I mean, I don't have that many from the past, but I have a few that a talk say from 2005 was referring to the difficult state of the world and the difficulties that we were facing at that time, you know. It does seem more amplified now. It is more amplified now. But, um, but this is how it is. And it's our job to be present with it with as much love and compassion as we can muster. So thank you again. And um, I'd be happy to have some conversation with anybody who has some questions or thoughts and i'm going to check in the chat okay just some recommendations good recommendations thank you everybody um yeah so if you want to just raise your hand which you can do in the reaction button down at the bottom of your screen if you're on a computer. Uh, I'm not sure quite where it is on your laptop or your phone, but we do have a hand raised. Um, Jim has his hand raised. So nobody can unmute themselves anymore, Jim, because that's to cope with our Zoom bombers. So Eva will unmute you. You're unmuted. Hey. Hi. Hey, hi, it's so good to be back. Um, first of all, thank you, Judy, for unpacking this human experience the way you do. Um, there's something about the way your brain and my brain work that I just hear everything you say without my monkey brain going, wait a minute, what about, you know, I just, I just get it. And it's such a gift. I'm so grateful for it. And um, uh, your topic couldn't have been more spot on for where where I'm at. I'm having a really hard time just being with upset and heartbreak and um, and uh, just you know all the stuff. I mean, you know, my history at this point is um, has got a lot of different textures and styles and so forth to it. And I've I've learned through this. Um, connection that I have to inside LA to, um, to choose my, my better, uh, my better parts, uh, as the, as the tools that I use. And, uh, I'll be real quick with this. I was in the parking lot at Trader Joe's a few days ago and I saw a minivan parked and it had writing on the windows, all the windows. And I'm not going to I'm not going to amplify it too much, but one of the windows there was writing on a lot of the windows, but one of them said, and I'm, I'm going to slightly censor this, but it said, I effing love Trump and Putin. And I felt instantly like I wanted to go over there and go, what's the matter with you? You know, like engage in this in that inflammatory thing, like I was it triggered that inflammatory statement triggered my inflammatory part. And so I went through that. And then I went, it was it, I was just observing my phases, I went through that. And then I then I went into my brain just going, Wow, what, what, you know, I just kept trying to understand why you would say that and why you would say it so publicly. And then I felt my heart soften. And then, you know, I calmed down and I and I, I I'm sure my blood pressure probably dropped. 20 points, uh, you know, in, a, in like a few minutes. 
Right. And I then began finding myself trying to understand her. And this was this a woman, I could see her. And I actually wanted to, like, if, if she hadn't been, at, at that point, she was pulling away, so I couldn't do this. But I thought, maybe I, maybe I should go talk to her and just say, hello, I just, uh, you know, engage rather than repel, you know. And uh, so I thought, oh, wow, that's, that's, I, I like that. I like that process and I like that that happened. And I'm, I was so grateful for it. And then I'll end with this. I realize that in any given moment, the very best, most powerful thing I can do is be kind. Yeah. And, and come from my heart and, and be generous and, and all that. And um, so anyway, that's, that's it for me. Thanks so much. Thank you. That's a great story. Um, and then you have now attained, you understand why the Dalai Lama said, my religion is kindness. That's yeah. a great statement. My religion mm -hmm. is kindness. And I told I, you, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I, I told you the story of my interaction with the Dalai Lama a, a while back. Remind us. Well, I was doing, a, 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 I'm a sound guy, so I do events at the Carpenter Center and Amnesty International gave him an award and he was there. So it was my job as the sound person to put a microphone on him. So I put the mic on him at the beginning and I took the mic off, collected it at the end. And then he was walking with his entourage toward the loading dock where their, where their vehicle was uh, sequestered. And uh, I said, I said, uh, your holiness, it is, it was such a gift to be in the same room with you. I think you're such a wonderful, I don't know what I said, but it's a very complimentary. And he looked at me with this sly smile and he said, you might not say that if you spent 24 hours with me. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just thought, oh my God, this is, you know, this is exactly what I needed to hear because I'm so self judgmental. Or, you know, I'm always picking at myself. Oh, you did that, blah, 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 that monkey mind, you know, that's nothing's ever right. But I just, you know, it just spoke to the humanness and <clears throat> to what you were saying earlier. It's like how this practice is our toolbox for this experience of, of having a human existence. You know, you we need these tools to stay in balance, like the boat, like the boat you were talking about. And I'm a, I'm a sailor, so I, I love that metaphor that spoke to me right away. So anyway, I, I just I'm so grateful for this, for you and for this whole thing that we do on Sundays. And I missed you terribly. And I'm glad to be back. Thanks. Well, I'm glad to be back too. And uh, two things. One is that kindness generates the willingness to be curious about the other person, which is what happened to you exactly. Yeah. And I will also say that you know, if you spent 24 hours with me, you might not feel that grateful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're human too? <laughs> yeah. And everybody, you should know Jim is the one who, he's really our uh, sound engineer at Inside LA. He's the one who makes sure these get posted and edits things out if need be. And so I just want to offer um, a huge bow of gratitude to you for your service, Jim. So, Ava, can you unmute Clark? Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'll just join Jim right away, Trudy, and thanking you so much. I don't know. You this this really warmed up my heart this morning. Um, it was just um, a wonderful experience with you, and you're always so open and warm and and touching and accessible and it was just amazing this morning for some reason what i'm really struck by with uh this circumstance what you're talking about is uh, what you and jack have talked about the role of equanimity in this and i always think about what do i understand about equanimity or what does it mean and how do i experience it <laughs> and once jack had said you know, one of the elements of equanimity is framing your awareness in a larger and larger frame, that that allows for equanimity. And I've been finding in so many circumstances that unburdens me of all kinds of angst with things like this. So, you know, one of the things a larger perspective tells me 
if we, you know, we all know our media is the media is designed to create a product that we as human beings respond to emotionally. And that means we all know the media is based on crisis and its product is to rev us up every day and focus on crisis. And um, if we step back a bit from what the media is feeding us and pull in a little equanimity and a little perspective, uh, part of what I realize and, and, and am aware of as we're watching Putin do this in this circumstance, he's done this before. This is an ongoing experience of humanity. Uh, Chechnya, the Syrian war, they were very much like this. And our media steals our brain into this immediate thing. But look, um, humanity, parts of it are at war and they have been at war. Uh, the other piece that this relates to me is racism in our country. Uh, I remember back, to, we were just uh, dealing with monuments that were posted in the around the country to, to glorify the civil war in the South. And remember, again, with equanimity and a, a bigger perspective, we had a discussion not too long ago saying, what are these monuments about? And over time, we learned actually they weren't uh, erected to honor the Civil War shortly after the Civil War. They were erected in the 19 teens when there was a big movement of Southern racism of the KKK and related organizations to, to, to celebrate their view of the Civil War. And it's just that that issue, racism in our country, it's, it exists. It's been going on for a long time. And equanimity again tells me to say, sitting with this is having some perspective. This is a long-term issue. This is a human issue. And to have right mind and my right speech about it is to do something with it. But understand that, you know, it's not going to evaporate. It's not going to go away. And the media crisis is not going to help us. It's just a crisis. So I don't know. That's what... That's what I'm thinking about equanimity. Um, this yeah, morning. yeah. Thank you, thank you, Clark. I think, you know, that's it's just another way of saying what Wolf Singer was saying. What you're saying is, you know, really understanding this huger picture that we're all in, and also, for me, it also means being willing to entertain multiple perspectives. Listen to the propaganda coming out of Moscow, coming out of Washington, coming out of, you know, just under, listen and realize just what you're saying about the media too. And um, Trevor Noah recently called out the double standard in the media. This was actually, um, I don't know, maybe 10 days ago um, in the media coverage of the crisis in Ukraine compared to the devastation in other regions like Africa and the Middle East. And um you know it's not that it's it's not that it's bad to care for and receive white refugees but how about the other ones um who are not being cared for or received so um yeah i'm just agreeing with you around that and i see there was a question in the chat um before calling on katie saying what did you mean by we know where this is headed so what I meant by that was not that I have some kind of political crystal ball and can tell you where the uh, geopolitical instability is headed. I meant that we know where this life is headed for each one of us. We know that this journey of life, you know, we present our boarding pass and we get on the plane and we know it's going to crash, but we still enjoy well, we used to, our meal or the movie we get to see on the plane or the person that we get to know sitting next to us and chatting with them or, you know, we enjoy the ride, um, but we know where it's headed. That's all I meant. And I was looking at it more from an existential perspective than a um, political perspective. I hope that's helpful. So can you unmute Katie, please? Thank you, Ava.
Haiti. So, Katie, you have your hand up, but are you remuting yourself or what's going on? Are you here? Did Gracie need attention and call you away? Maybe. Okay, so I'm guessing Katie will be back. And in the meantime, is there anybody else who... Oh, she said it won't let her unmute. Ava, she has to be allowed to unmute. Um, you should be able to unmute yourself, Katie. And if you are not receiving the prompts, um, I'm sorry, but I'm not sure what else I can do. <clears throat> can you try again, Katie? Well, I'm really sorry. I was looking forward to seeing you. So, Katie, in the meantime, do you want to put your question in the chat? Or that's so strange because you've successfully unmuted the rest of us, Ava. So I know you know what to do. You've done this so many times. Um, So in the meantime, is there anybody else who would like to share your perspective? Um, yeah, put your comment in the chat and um, yeah. So she. Ava will unmute you, uh, will allow you to unmute yourself. It's, it's confusing when I say Ava will unmute you. She will now allow you to unmute yourself. She did, and it worked. Um, hi. Um, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't have a lot of good words because <laughs> I'm struggling. But um, during the meditation, you said, and I wrote it down, um, may, I, may I allow joy and sorrow to peacefully coexist in the same heart. Um, and I, I, for lack of a better word, like, how do you do that? You know, like, how do you feel like the grief and the sorrow that feels, at least for me, like lifelong and the joy feels so like, little speckles right and how do you like not allow the grief to become the way that you frame your life you know and especially like um like for me the last several years like politically all of that I just I felt like everything in me just kind of hardened because it was like all the violence became so mundane you know um, and it becomes mundane in regards to the way certain people in the world are valued and then not in, I, I don't know if I'm saying this, I don't have the right words, honestly, um, cause it's overwhelming, but it's like when you internalize hierarchies of like oppression, um, it's hard to not just live in them and respond with care and love, like rather. So I try, I try really hard. Um, just a, a silly example. I was, in a, I was walking into a friend's house the other day. She lives in a wealthy area of Los Angeles. I do not. Um, and there was someone else there and I, and it was just, a, it wasn't a, it's not a big house or anything, but um, he looked at me and he said, oh, do you work here? And I, yeah, and like, you know, sometimes I forget that that's the way I can be seen in the world, right? Because um, I, I wanna, don't want to live in that world either, but I have internalized it. And I didn't say anything to him. Like I wanted a good comeback, but I didn't have one. Um, and instead afterwards, I just tried to send him love. Like I just tried to send him, you know, 
care. And I just tried to think of him as a person. And that actually helps rather than um, create this inner conflict, right? Um, and so it's like, how to experience the beauty of the world and then you know have that tinge of just ouch all the time. I don't know if I'm making sense because I'm so overwhelmed. You are making total sense and it's a huge question and it's a <laughs> question. And I wanna start by saying, you need to come back first of all. <laughs> you need <laughs> to come back in ahead of time when that, for things like that when they happen. Just <laughs> people like, no, do you work here? Um, I don't yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean it doesn't have to yeah. be me. just a comeback mm -hmm. um, I have to afterwards but you know too late of course you think of it afterwards but I'm just saying prepare yourself have a few mm -hmm. in your pocket because microaggressions are gonna they happen they're inevitable it's just part of what Clark was saying it's the racism in our world and and people don't they're clueless they don't think before they speak they don't realize what they're saying and if they do they don't know how to care perhaps or you know whatever so that's the first thing have some in your back pocket <laughs> <laughs> um and then you know it's a deeper question what you're asking and i want to come back to the beginning when you talked about sort of this backdrop of grief and then the speckles of joy and sure the speckles in a way mixed metaphors can't hold a candle to all that grief that, mm. right? but at the same time um part of our practice a huge part of our practice is bringing attention to those speckles and focusing on them whether it's the joy that i have it's a tiny joy but i always have joy from seeing those pom-poms behind you i've mentioned it before <laughs> colors and the pom-poms and that you hang them there and that's your zoom backdrop i love it <laughs> a little speckle of joy so or it's like last night i was babysitting and playing with um our three-year-old grandson and he kept changing the crayon i would write something and then he would scribble over it um cross it out um grind it up was the point the <laughs> the word he was using with his crayons and then he kept wanting me to use a different color and then he finally just said i love all the colors so it's like taking that speckle of joy and bringing your attention to it and and, and yes it's contrived but we have to make a concerted contrived effort to um balance the conditioning of sorrow in the heart, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's 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 part of metta practice of loving kindness, which is about gladdening the heart. I think it's very noble of you to have offered love to him, but personally, I would have said offer it to yourself first because you got hurt in that. That was hurtful. Um, there you are visiting a friend and hanging out and you get reminded that you're seen in a certain way by some, you know what I mean? That's hurtful. Mm -hmm. So the meta for yourself, first of all, a few comebacks in your pocket, meta for <laughs> and amplifying the speckles of joy till they become sparkles. Maybe they're just little sparkles, but you're going to bring attention to them. And that's what Thich Nhat Hanh is talking about. So she, when he talks about nurturing, planting and nurturing seeds of joy, they're just seeds. You know, and you may not even be feeling the joy or the love. It doesn't matter. You're planting and nurturing those seeds every time you come here, every time you meditate, every time you are aware of the conflict within your heart. Do you know what I mean? That's yeah. all part of it. So it takes practice. That's why, and, and, it, and it takes um, community to support a practice. It's too lonesome and grim otherwise. So that's why we're here. So thank you so much for sharing from your heart. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, now Katie's gonna try again. Oh, she put her question in the chat. Uh, okay, it's in the chat. I'm gonna read it. I love what you said about equanimity, seeing all sides as best we can, and not calling a particular person evil. 
For me, it's easy to do when I see the impact of a person's decision in this war. Easy to call them evil, I'm assuming you mean, yeah. Well, it, yes, it is easy. I feel that too. But then when I think of what kind of upbringing and attachment bonding someone must have had to go on to behave such a way, it gives me more compassion. Uh, no, more empathy. Well, same idea, but thank you. More empathy for our conditioned lives, especially childhood trauma. Also, I wanted to share a perspective from a Russian friend who is devastated by this war and believes that most of the Russian people do not want this war, but are restricted in their freedoms of speech and action. He hopes we will extend brotherhood to the people of Russia when this is over because he feels more, oh, this brings tears to me, because he feels more connected to us as a family than to the will of his president. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank thanks, you. Trudy. Yeah, I think it works now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah thanks for letting me share that because I, I struggled too with, I love with the ups and downs and anger and and then I'm trying to circle back and have a bit better perspective and still like really have a heart towards the Ukrainian people. And, and like you said, the people around the world that aren't getting the attention. So I just appreciate, um, yeah, the perspective of brotherhood and sisterhood. And, and, and I appreciate your um, compassionate perspective on the childhood or the upbringing yeah. of somebody like Putin grow up in yep. union, was a KGB operative. You know, that's like a CIA operative, um, has two daughters, I think they're grown by now, and a wife and is a fa father and a grandfather and has a life. Do you know what I mean? Like this is a, yep. even though this person has backed themselves into a horrible corner and is doing something atrocious, um, there's no denying that. Um, and even if our country was provocative and wrong, two wrongs don't make a right. I mean, all those things are true. But um, but thank you for that uh, really compassionate perspective. And it kind of inspires, like kind of what you said, just the, the love or what Jim even was talking about of trying to be loving even to someone with a different like political view, because you don't, even like with the children, or, or how we impact, we just don't know how it's going to impact their future. So it just made me even more, uh, I guess I wanted to share, like aware of like grace and bonding and attachment and love. And then, you know, hopefully she'd be less likely to, she'd be more likely to grow up with that compassion and perspective because it was given to her versus, I don't know if that makes sense too. Like with those kids, you said, of yeah, course. the kids that are calling the hotline and stuff, it's teaching them. The so kids made the hotline for us. Kate. Yeah, they made yeah. the ones who are offering the wisdom and advice on their hotline in their little little baby voices. <laughs> They're not babies. And I hope I hope they take it into adulthood. You know, because they've been shown another another way to live in hard times. So you hope they carry it into adulthood. But thank you. Some of it's very simple advice, like you know, if you're really unhappy. Um, eat a cookie, or maybe you could go get some ice cream. You know, some of it's very simple, but um, <laughs> if you don't live in California where everyone's like terrified of carbs, um, <laughs> you could take that advice and enjoy it. So uh, yeah, thank you, Katie, thank you. And as a mom, I have no doubt that you're giving that to Gracie, I no doubt. And she's gonna have a really different experience of herself when as she grows up thanks to your mothering yeah yeah so let's sit for a moment together in uh, gratitude and appreciation for having this time and having this eightfold path and having each other
So we offer the goodness of our practice to all beings everywhere without exception. As a way of expressing our gratitude and appreciation for these teachings, for the benefit that we receive from them, and for the way that the teachings bring us together in community. For all of these blessings, we want to share them. We want to share all these blessings. So we offer this wish, this blessing, this prayer. May we and all beings grow in our capacity <clears throat> to steady our hearts and to respond wisely and peacefully to the challenges of our personal, interpersonal, and planetary lives. So thank you, everybody. Um, you can unmute everybody, Ava. I I got muted. Sorry. Thank you, everybody. I don't know. Could you hear me? Did 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 you hear the dedication? Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> and I just want to say that I am. <laughs> I have another writing deadline. I have to set these deadlines, otherwise months go by and I don't work on that book at all, which did happen um, after Katie J and Gabriel were killed. I didn't work on it at all. So Melissa is going to teach next Sunday. Uh, come and sit with Melissa and I will see you the following week. Um, and I really, the following week, um, I also am going to offer some words of on behalf of Michael Stroud, our, we offered Menta for him a couple weeks ago, and I'm sorry to tell you that he passed away. Uh, he did not make it. And so actually having just told you this news and seeing your expressions and realizing that you didn't know, um, I would like to offer before we take the break for the breakout groups, that we just take a moment to offer some Metta to Michael to his beloved partner, Francis, and, uh, and just to sit with um, the love and appreciation for a teacher who touched many people's lives and was a very kind, sweet, loving man. So let's just I'll ring the bell and then um, I'll ring the bell again and then I will see you next week. I would like to tell you that I was able to offer Michael the refuges in the ICU by Zoom. He was dying. And I know he heard me. His breathing changed, his coloring changed. He received the refuges. In the Buddha, in the true nature, the Buddha nature that brings us here today, refuge in the teachings that help us live and die, and refuge in the community that holds us, with whom we walk hand in hand from our birth to our death. And I'm going to write something about Michael in our 
um, newsletter this week as well. I want to thank you all again for your presence and your love and your caring and encourage you to join a breakout group in 10 minutes. Right, Ava? You're going to do them? Okay, good. Yes. All right. Thank you, everybody. And thank I you, Trudy. Two weeks. Thanks, Trudy. Next week. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Trudy. Thank you. Beautiful teaching. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye.
Candace? We can unmute apparently. Yes. <laughs> well, hello everyone. Hello. It's about time, right? <laughs> it's about oh, time. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Hi, Janet. Hi, Janet. How are you? Hi. I am well, Hi, thank you. Hi, Candace. Hello. I think Camille might be here. Yeah, there she is. Hi, Hi. Camille. Diana, are you there? 
I'm pretty sure Gabby is there. Yeah. Or she'll be probably be back. On her hike. In a minute. I'm Diana, if you're there, you know, if you could unmute yourself and let us know or you know, turn on your camera, that would be very helpful to um make sure that uh, no one's get assigned, uh, you know, in the empty room. Sherry wanted me to let everybody know that she can't make it today and that she misses everybody. Who? Thank you. Thank you. Sherry. Oh. Sherry Shaw. Wasn't she just she sent there? Yeah, she was there, but she sent me a text to say that she couldn't stay and she wanted to let everybody know and that she misses us. Hmm. Nice. Thank nice. You. All right, uh, it's 12.45 and uh, Gabby, are you there? I know, you know, she, she was coming in and I'm here, I'm here. oh, there you are. Are you yeah. having tech difficulty today? No, I'm I, good. Okay, because I noticed that uh, you had to come back in a couple times. So no, I, I accidentally, uh, I accidentally got myself out. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> that happens. I know how I like, oops. All right, I'm going to put everyone. I'm gonna open up the rooms now, and uh, let's go till one o'clock, and then we'll come back, and you know we'll close off for the day. Here we go. Okay. Okay.
Oh, okay. Main session. Ah, thanks, well. Gabby. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Having breakfast. <laughs> Oh, that's I, cool. Yeah, we, we're we, gonna go biking. We kind of had an interesting discussion, you know. Sometimes where uh, someone treats us in a manner that that gives us sorrow, and then how do you gladden your heart when that happens? And uh, you know, I I think it's through having uh, a good experience that kind of washes away the unhappiness. And I, I have a, you know, a certain few things that, that'll do it for me. You know, sometimes it's exercise or a treat uh, that I can eat, something that I can eat, or seeing the sunshine, looking at the sky and getting that larger perspective. And uh, if anyone has any other things that gladden their hearts, Oh, you mentioned that, mentioned that book that you have, Jack Cornfield's book. Yes, yes. This book really helped me. What's uh, the book? The Art, the Art of Forgiveness, Loving oh. Kindness, and Peace. And it's in the Santa Monica Library if anyone has access to it. Yeah, but a lot of uh, you can get those uh, electronically, too, through your library card. Oh, really? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, wow. Yeah, you can get, I know you can get a lot of books through, uh, is it Hoopla? I don't know. My library uses Hoopla. Right. Yeah. You and, can um, overdrive and you can, as well. Yep. Yeah. And I got a, I have a teacher. I really like her. Uh, she's with Napa Inside Meditation. If you guys ever want to come and join us, <laughs> they're pretty good. Um, she's really good. Deborah Devin. And um, I was sharing that with the, the person I had the group today. She was sharing a book that she's reading, All Path White Clouds from Thich Nhat Hanh. Oh, yeah. Um, you can borrow that one on the library. At least up here you can. I can put it on the chat. But she said it was really yeah, good. Yeah, what's it called? Uh, old, old, old Path White Clouds. Old Path White Clouds. Huh. So, you know, he went through war experience and, and, and we touched base on... You know how he how he this guy's able to smile after he went through yeah war. yeah it's like wow <laughs> like that's amazing but i i was reading this week also about our oxytocin as human as human you know because i study mental health we also have to study the biology of the body oxytocin yeah. is so important to our body and there's different ways you can increase it like, um, I like petting the house dog. Her name is Bailey. <laughs> and I love her to death. We have like morning uh, rituals. And, you know, pets trust you when they like, they chop their belly and like, rub my belly, rub it, rub it. And I rub her and she's like, ah. And it's like, you could tell like the difference in my body and her body. So we both get our oxytocin boost. And um, another one, like hugging people, but it was really hard during COVID. So I started like hugging my dad more, like just, hey, how you doing? Because he just had a knee surgery. So I was being nice. more like, like, because I haven't done in a while because of COVID, you, lo you lose the hug thing. And I noticed that the other day I said, I'm having hug people. And there's this guy that did a research that he said, if you hug people eight times a day, your oxytocin level increase. And everything else you said, but not like, uh, you know, going out on, on a hike or the sun or your vitamin D, you know, um, mothers that breastfeed, their oxytocin level goes mm -hmm. up too. And so all relationships too. So it's like a natural, it's a substance that our body um, increases like our happy hormones. Yeah. Well, we have three dogs and they all love us. Uh, very different uh, and, um, but they all lick uh, <laughs> they do have their parts that require a little extra love <laughs> <laughs> and they get jealous of each other sometimes that's so like, funny which one is next to the human you know <laughs> yeah yeah I that's very human uh, okay so now um it's almost time to say goodbye. Is there any other last minute 
comments? No, thanks. Thanks for moderating. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, I really enjoyed Thank this. You. Thanks, Thank guys. You. Thanks for being Thank here. Have great a great coverage. week. Everybody have a great week. Yeah, yeah. have a good weekend. Take care. Okay. Bye, Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you.